Welcome to Muslim Apologetics Australia. This is the third counter battle. Uh, but what I want to do is, uh, in the second part of the video, uh, what we had is some audio difficulty issues. I think two minutes of my response uh, was not recorded. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go back to the points that my audio sound did not come through. So this is a third video readdressing I think it was one or two points uh, within the two minutes. So this isn't a long video. Uh, please have patience and we'll go through it. But before I do, I did have a quick text exchange with another uh, non-Muslim, uh, Abdullah Semid's friend. Uh, and uh, he spokes about, um, he tries to refute my point uh, about uh, that, you know, where I disputed about millions of people of uh, Dhulkarnain, you know, them being millions of people. Uh, he quotes al, uh, the tafsir from al Buktabari, but notice Buk al Tabari doesn't have Isnad for a lot of its uh, information, so it's not very strong. Uh, so the information. On, it actually states it on page 3 of its book that if anyone objects to the information, then no, it's not attributed to us. So uh, Tabari was a historian. He collected both true and wrong information. It's not classified as a complete Sahih uh, edition. So when they go out to Al-Tabari, which mentions that Gog and Magog consists of uh, 400,000 men, uh, this uh, and, and then it goes on that they had many nations which constantly consisted of 400,000 men and they try and say, well, it is a million. Uh, if we don't take Al-Tabari as an authority. Uh, again, Tabari doesn't provide Isnad for all of his information. As, he, as he's a historian, he collects both correct and wrong information. So relying on book Al-Tabari is not a wise thing to do. Uh, he tries to object my second point where I said that there is no... Um, time frame when the when they actually drank from the water pool uh, from the river or the lake uh, there's no time frame because they're saying oh it must have been millions and millions of people because how could the lake go dry with water um, but the hadith or the tafsir uh, it doesn't give an indication of the time frame nor does it give a description on the proximity of the lake and so forth um, uh, how big it is you know what was the depth of the water and so forth. Uh, so, um, so in response, he tries to bring a quote from the Tefsir that says, And they drank the water of the earth so that some of them go through the river and drink it until they leave it dry, so that those who came behind them to pass by the river says there used to be water here. So he's basically trying to say, because people came directly behind them, this means that you know, it was a short period of time until the water was finished. Uh, and then, which proves that they were very large in number, like in the millions. Uh, the response is, where does it say the time frame or the magnitude? Just because it says those who came behind them does not mean they came behind them right away. People traveled back then on journey for months and months, if not years and years. Therefore, it could have taken them months or, or years to catch up and come behind them. No no one here is misinformed. As for the 400,000 plus, I don't believe this is based on an authentic hadith on Prophet Muhammad. Later, it's uh, rather it's just a historical later opinion, uh, which is collected in Book Al-Tabari. Uh, we can see that Allah could have trapped thousands, if not millions of people beneath the, uh, beneath the actual ground. Uh, even if it is millions, I could still disprove it, um, you know, because uh, you know, it doesn't prove anything, even if it is millions, because the hadith says they dig until they see the sunlight, which means what is above them is also covered, not just the gate, which proves it could be underground for why it's difficult to locate them. So the main gate, the iron gate, could be covered with leaves. It could be completely covered. And above them, that could be a ground, like a tunnel going down beneath the earth, covered. How do we know this? Because there's a hadith that says in Sahih ibn Majah, which quotes, when Allah wishes to send them against the people, they will dig until they can 
almost see sunlight. Then the one who is in charge of them will say, go back and we'll dig again tomorrow. Uh, so as you can see the hadith, it says that they're digging. So it seems that there, no sunlight is penetrating this place. But when they get close enough to dig out, a, a bit of light protrudes, but then Allah closes it again. So it shows that these people are trapped inside a mountain or a tunnel hole somewhere beneath the earth where no sunlight is penetrating it. So this in itself debunks Abdullah Samir when he goes around saying, oh, we can't see him, we can't find him, we, we, we've traveled and we've looked around, where of course you can't because it, it, is, it is not accessible, obviously. It's beneath the ground. So when I asked Abdullah, and this is the part that my audio was cut, um, so I'm going to now address this point, going to 10.44, minute 10.44. Uh, when I asked Abdullah Semir, have you looked at every part of the earth to confirm that the gate of Dhul Qarnayn doesn't exist? And look at his response. He says, no, but I can be reasonably sure it does not. I mean, how can you be... I mean, if you haven't looked everywhere, how can you be sure... It does not. I mean, if your mother told you, look, um, you know, go wear some socks, they're in your room, and you say to your mother, well, I don't believe it's in my room, and your mother says to you, well, have you looked everywhere in your room? And you say, no, I haven't, but I believe that it doesn't exist in my room. I mean, do you see how silly that would sound if that's what you told your mother? So why would you come to the conclusion you're reasonably sure it does not, yet you admit that you haven't looked at every part of the earth. I mean, it's just that ridiculous. Uh, then uh, Abdullah says, you know, he tries to criticize this to say, look, um, did you know that the Quran mentions, or, well, or the Hadith and so forth, it mentions something about, uh, hang on, Okay, no, he's speaking about other historical sources, the Syriac Alexandra Romans, uh, which actually mentions a story of people trapped um, behind the copper iron. And he's, well, what he's basically trying to say is that the Quran is making up stuff, it's copying stories of the fables. Other stories, other historical stories, that other stories were going around that people were trapped behind an iron door, therefore the Quran is making stuff up too. But you see, this is another fallacy and another double-edged sword. You see, when a critic comes to the Quran, they like to say things like, um, is there any historical evidence that what the Quran is saying is true? Is there any historical evidence to this? And you ask them, what do you mean by historical evidence? They say, oh, well, anything outside the Quran that supports what the Quran is saying is true. Do we have any archive information? And when you tell them, no, we don't have any, then they say, oh, the Quran is just making things up. But then when you show them historical evidence besides the Quran that exists and confirm what the Quran is saying is true, then you, wanna, you know what they say? They say, oh, the Quran was copying other stories. So notice the inconsistency. It's like a double-edged sword. You're damn if you do and you're damn if you don't. That's not intellectually honest, my friend. Uh, and then he says, extraordinary evidences need extraordinary claims. No, extraordinary evidences don't need extraordinary claims. It needs adequate evidence. And we can follow the Quran, and the Quran gives us enough details. It's the word of God. Therefore, whatever comes after that, other miracles and signs and lessons that we haven't seen or will see in the future, it doesn't mean that those things don't exist or won't come to pass. He then asked for burden of proof for Dhulkarnain. Uh, well, if you're making the claim that it does not exist and you're certain about that, then you need to show your own burden of proof that it doesn't exist. Just like a mother will tell the son, well, go and look, for, you know, f take a picture of every part of your room. Give me evidence that your socks don't exist. You know, so the burden of proof is upon you to prove it doesn't exist. And you haven't done that. And then imagine you reporting back to your mother and saying, oh, look, I haven't taken picture of the whole room and investigated it. But you know what? Uh, it just doesn't exist. But your mother says, well, have you checked every spot? And you turn around and say, well, no, I haven't. So 
Again, if you haven't, then it'd be irrational for you to tell your mother, I certainly believe it doesn't exist. And then you go and tell your mother, oh, the burden of proof is on you. No, your mother will say the burden of proof is on you. Go and look, as I said. And then you report back saying, well, I haven't looked properly or I haven't looked at all. And then you still stay on the conclusion, oh, it doesn't exist. Your mother will laugh at you and probably smack you on the back of the head. Uh, he then speaks about how, you know, there's more accurate information in Plato uh, where, you know, they describe the spherical bodies in heaven and so forth. And he says, you know, Muhammad, well, obviously he's trying to say Muhammad wasn't the only genius. Other people made predictions and so forth as well. And uh, just in case I haven't addressed this, uh, uh, Dr. Zakir Naik actually mentions a beautiful argument to those who say, oh, look, other people of the past mentioned stuff. Well, other people do mention stuff, but if they've mentioned 10 things, usually most of them are incorrect and one is right. And that's how we evaluate whether something is from God or not. Where, as the Prophet Muhammad, when he says something through the revelation of Quran, all of it's right. Therefore, you can determine which is the book of God and which is the fables of man. And really quickly, uh, he then ch shifts the goalpost and he speaks about the sun and the moon, uh, again, he says, we are faced with two possibilities. He says, Muhammad thought the sun and the moon went around the earth. Um, there is absolutely no statement. Abdullah Gundal could not provide any single reference of that explicit quote. So he's making stuff up. Uh, and then he speaks about orbit of sun around the Milky Way was a galaxy. Well, again, the sun could travel in a Milky Way or a galaxy, it doesn't mean its circumferences, specifically the Earth's orbit. Uh, so, again, um, he's mixing two things together. There's a total difference. The stuff that the critics say is that the Sun specifically travels around the Earth and there is no statement to support that. Uh, he then shifts the goalpost and speaks about murky water, uh, that the Sun goes into a pool of murky water, which means it goes into the earth. Uh, so which one is it? First, their argument is the sun goes around the earth, and now they're saying it goes in the earth. So which one is it? See, they can't even get the storyline straight. Um, and again, uh, he's shifting the goalposts, and sun setting in murky water was not part of his original argument in his video why he left Islam. So he's adding arguments because he understands he looks defeated and weak with the initial arguments he presented in his video. And again, watch the video link below this video. I've refuted in detail another ex-Muslim who goes by the name of Mars Arab regarding does the sun actually sit in murky water and we refute his allegations upon the tefsir of the Quran and we show the dubious arguments are refuted. He then says, so to claim or describe the intergalactic orbit requires additional evidence or a stretcher interpretation. Well, we don't have to stretch the interpretation. It actually says that the sun and the um, moon, they swim in their own orbits. It doesn't have to specifically say what it is or how it is or what it actually circulates and so forth. It doesn't have to specify that. If you're making the claim that it goes specifically around the earth, then it is the burden of proof is upon your shoulders, not our shoulders, if you're making the claim.